Uh, we are in week four or week five, whatever it is, of discipleship. Three, four, five, something like that. And what we've been doing is systematically going through a discipleship process. If you were new to church, if you were new to God, what would that process and what were the things that you need to know look like growing and maturing spiritually? And, and I'll tell you kind of why this happened. I was already working on a program, writing uh, a system by which we would disciple people. And I just didn't have the energy to write a third material every single week while I was doing it. So you guys get to go through discipleship on Wednesday nights, all right? In Mark 10, 45, it says this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. For even Jesus did not come to this earth to be served. You remember the time he brought his disciples together and he washed their feet? He was showing them, I have came to this earth to serve you. Tonight's topic is we're all called to serve. We're all called to serve. If you're a outliner, this is A, capital A, point A. Your purpose in life as God's son or daughter is to be like Jesus, right? That, that's kind of our job, our, our position, to be like Jesus. In Romans 8, 29, it says that we are to be conformed to his image, that we are to be in his likeness. So we are to live lives like Jesus. And that's kind of hard, I'll be honest with you. I gave up on trying to not make mistakes a long time ago. It was so much bondage. But I choose, I, I hope that the way I treat others would be like Jesus. You know, Paul said, be like me. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And when Jesus told us to be like him, he was actually talking about in his love. Jesus was a man without sin. He never made a wrong choice. He never made a wrong decision. And we can't identify with that. We do it all the time. We do it all the time, right? But we are to desire or our purpose in life is to be more like Jesus every day. So what, this is the one under the A, what was Jesus's purpose in life? What was Jesus's purpose in life? And it told us in Mark 10, 45, that he came to serve and to give, to serve and to give. I'm gonna read it again. For even the son of man, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's a mission of ours that we, in, in church and what our calling is, is to serve and to give, all right? Number two, underneath that, Jesus was and is the son of God. I'm gonna give you some names. He's the great I am. He's the prince of peace. He's the light of the world. He's the bread of life, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the alpha and omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He who is, who was, and who is to come. He's the almighty, yet he didn't come to earth for fame or any of those titles. He did not come to earth for popularity attention, power, or to be the center of everyone's party. He came to do two things, to serve and to give. Letter B, five things. There's five things that I believe that can keep you from serving God at the capacity that you're called to serve God. There's five things hindering people from serving God at the capacity that they could serve God. Now, you listen to what I'm saying, I'm being very intentional. I believe there's a lot of people who somewhat serve God, but they don't serve God to the capacity that they could serve God, okay? Five things, number one is this, pride. Pride, we all have it. We all have some level of pride, all of us. Some more than others. We have a level of pride. Pride can be a good thing. Pride can be a damaging and destructive thing. Pride. First Kings 12.1. Watch this story. 
It says, but Rehoboam, Rehoboam, we'll just say that's what, how you say it. Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. They replied, if today you will be a servant of these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Then King Ro, King Ro consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. Ro answered, um, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke that he put on us and we will serve you. So he said, have mercy on us. Like your dad was harsh on us, just have mercy on us. And this young king's like, what do I do? Did I give, do I give them mercy or do I keep them enslaved? What do I do? So they sent for Jerob, we say Jerob. They sent, they sent for Jerob and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Ro and said to him, when Jero, son of Nabat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon, he returned from Egypt, and Ro went to Shechem, and all, uh, for all of Israel had gone there to make him the king. And this is what they said. They said this to him. If you have mercy on them, then they're gonna kind of think that they could do and be whatever they wanna be. Keep them enslaved. Keep them under harsh rule. This is what the young people said. The elder said, free them, have mercy on them. But when he didn't get the favorable answer that he wanted from his elders, when his pride came up, he said, no, I don't wanna have mercy. I don't wanna be Mr. Nice Guy. When that pride rose up within him, he had to go find people who would tell him what he wanted to hear. And it, you ever find yourself asking someone for advice and when they don't give you the advice you wanted, you go find somebody else to give you advice? And when they don't give you the advice that you wanted, you go find somebody else and ask them for advice until finally somebody's on your side. How come nobody's on my side? Well, because you might be wrong. You're probably wrong. And so he went with the young men's advice instead of his elders' advice. Pride rose up within him. Pride rose up within him to say, I'm not serving these people. They will serve me. Ouch. That's a yucky one. Who's serving me? Well, who are you serving? Number two, Number two thing, stopping people from serving God at the capacity they could serve is that they're wanting people to notice their efforts. Are people gonna see me? Are they gonna notice me? It's funny, the list for people who wanna be on the worship team is so long, but people to work in the nursery and change dirty diapers, well, there isn't a list. They say, well, we don't have a position on the worship team on the, on the main stage right now, but we have a position in children's ministry leading worship. No, no, please. So are you called to worship or are you called to be seen? John twelve forty three says, for they loved human praise more than the praise from God. <laughs> Can I be honest with you about something when it comes to like my sermon writing? When people come up and tell me like, oh, Pastor Mike, that was such a great message. The, that doesn't really do a lot for me. Like the words of affirmation for my preaching doesn't really do a lot for me, except if it comes from my dad. My dad knows what it takes to put a message together week in and week out. He knows how much effort and study and work it takes to do it. So in my mind, and I may be totally wrong, he's actually qualified to tell me whether that was a good sermon or not. Huh? Let me tell you something about men, ladies. Only a man can affirm a man. When a, when a man's looking for affirmation, 
a, a female can't really fill that love tank. A man can only affirm a man. And so when a man is told by another man, dude, that's awesome. That was amazing. Man, you're looking sharp. You're looking muscular. That does something to a man. I'm just throwing that out there. That was just freebie for somebody who needs it. But when it comes to serving, it's a danger when you want people to see your effort. When people see what I'm doing around here. Do you see everything I do around here? No, actually, am I supposed to? Like, what are we, what are we in this for? What are, what, are we, what are we in this for? All right, number three, sorry. This is discipleship, guys. Number three, being worried about what other may think of you or they might reject your efforts to serve. Watch this, Galatians 1.10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Woo! If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Almost a year ago, next month will be one year, I was away on a fishing trip. And I was all by myself on the boat. And I was going down the river. Well, I had a guide, but I didn't have any other fishing partners with me. It was just me and this guide. And I was sitting out in front of the boat fly fishing. And I was really seeking the Lord for some answers. I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with myself. I wasn't happy with my preaching. I wasn't happy with my home. I wasn't happy with the direction the church was going. And I really felt like I needed to make some changes, some cultural changes in the church, some style changes in the church. And as I was toiling, there's like this battle going on inside of me. I kind of made this decision. This is, this is what I'm going to do. This is the way I'm going to go. And I felt the Holy Spirit in front of God ask me in that moment, are you sure, this is what he said to me, are you sure this is the direction that you're supposed to take the church? And are you sure this is the kind of message you're called to preach? So two things, the direction and the message. So my message, the way I preach and the message and the way I package it, it's very different than, than a lot of churches, right? And so real quick, yes, God, of course, yes, I'm, I'm certain. And then he asked me a qualifying question. Qualifying question that I could not answer in that one day. He said, even if everyone leaves you, even if everyone leaves your church and you come in on a Sunday morning and you're the only one standing on that stage, are you sure this is the direction you're supposed to take the church and this is the message that you're supposed to preach? Whoo! Well, number one, I don't like being alone. I always have people around me. So to think of everyone leaving me and I don't take rejection very well, and I don't take loss very well. I don't know, God, like, what do you mean by everyone? Who do I get to keep? Who stays, ready? Who stays just for me? Hard. And the Lord brought me to this message. He said, am I now trying to get the approval of people or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Amen. Number four reason that stops people from serving God at the capacity that they could serve God. You ready for this one? It's not easy. The love of money. The love of money can hinder people from serving God at the capacity that they could. You can look that up in Matthew 6, 24 and 1 Timothy 6, 10. But here's the point behind that. When gaining money is more important than helping people, your priorities are wrong. When gaining money is more important than helping people, your priorities are wrong. All right? So let me throw this out there. We very often think of the different ways we can make more money. Granted, I believe in multiple streams of income myself. We spend time 
thinking of different ways to make money. But here's a question. When's the last time you spent time thinking about how you could help more people? How can I help more people? Like, that one's not always at the forefront of our minds. How can what I do every day help more people? How can I impact more people's lives with what I do? But we very quickly can find ourselves, how can I make more money? Let me have a yard sale. Whatever it is. I need to get some more money. I need some spending cash. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just saying, switching our minds to hearts of servanthood. Okay. Remember this story, a guy named Judas Iscariot? He was willing to betray Jesus for money because loving money perverts your judgment and opens you up to do things that you wouldn't normally do. It's, it's one of those things. It's, it can be a tragedy when money becomes a thing that determines whether you go to church or serve at church or not. Luke 22, 4 through 6, you can read that. Number five, the number five thing that I see as a hindrance to people serving at the capacity that they could serve is being worried about what you might lose if you serve God or being consumed with stuff. What am I going to miss out on by being at church too much or serving God at the capacity that I'm called to serve him in Matthew 19, 21? Right? So these are the five things. Over the 27 years that I've been in ministry, this is what I see. One of these things happens. Here, here, here's a classic example. Pastor Mike, will you pray for me that I get a job? Absolutely, I'll pray for you to get a job. They come in, oh, I believe God gave me the perfect job. I'm like, awesome, man, praise God. The only thing is, it's on Sundays now, and I can't come to church anymore. Okay? You sure that's from God? Or is that a bootleg? <coughs> you ever watch a bootleg movie? No? Y'all saved. They never watch no bootleg movies. <coughs> bootleg movie looks good on the outside, but when you pop it in, you quickly realize that somebody's having a camera trying to videotape the screen. Right? It looked good. It looked right until it didn't look right. Well, well, I prayed for a job, and this is the first one that came along, so this must be God. It, it could be a setup. Next thing you know, they're leaving the church. The family's getting divorced. The kids are drug addicts. Was that because they stopped coming to your church? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the priorities got out of whack. The priorities got out of whack. This is just one of the examples is all I'm saying. Another one, ready? I'm just, I'm just going to throw this out there, man. Some families got their kids involved in too many school sports that they're never going to be good at. Sorry. If your kid sat the bench all four years of high school football, it wasn't worth missing ch church. Okay. I love you. Letter C, God's plan for greatness. You want to know God's plan for greatness? Be a servant. You know, the highest person on Jesus' totem pole is the servant of all. Be a servant. Be a servant. Most of our societies operate on positions of authority. Our life, society, it's all about your position of authority. Our government is based on position of authority. Our military, position of authority. Corporations, positions of authority. Sports, are you the captain of the team or not? Position of authority. And God's kingdom is totally different than society. He says, who serves the greatest? Who's committed to making someone else's life better? Are you committed to help making someone else's life better? My team will tell you, I am committed to making every single one of their lives better. But that doesn't always look pretty. I'm my, my team's biggest fan. 
I encourage them. I build them up. I tell them I have the most amazing team right now. But some days, John Mark especially, he's going to catch the wrath. He's like, what are you doing? Stop talking. Get back over here. Think this process through. Come on now, son. Right? Sometimes I got a little pow pow, a little fire under them. But he's not walking out of here saying, Pastor Mike, you know, he hates me. No, he knows that I want to see the best out of him. That I always speak the best of my team in front of other people. Right? Come on. Is this a desire of yours? Serving others, bringing out the best. All right? Now, God isn't upset when you desire to be great. God's not upset with you desiring to be great. He placed that desire in us when we were young, right? But he says, if you want to be great, if you desire to be great, if that's in you, I want to be great, great, be a servant. Be a servant. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if we're getting this. Yeah, but, but, but do it. That's not going to, yeah. Yeah, it's called servant leadership. And in fact, in generation Z and generation Y and generation X and all these gens that are coming up right now, servant leadership is how multi-billion dollar organizations are th flourishing. The day of dictator boss sitting behind a desk with his feet up, yelling at everybody and screaming, man, that's just TV. That, that's, that's not, I mean, now maybe your job, someone's a little crazy, but you don't actually want to work for them. You're talking about them behind their back. You hate their guts, but you just keep going back because of the paycheck. Jesus is telling us, you want to have a multi-billion dollar corporation? Serve your staff. Serve those around you. When you walk through the hall, ask any of your employees, is there anything I can do for you today? Is there anything I can help you do to make your job better today? Is there anything I can do to help you, help you along and get this process done faster today? Jesus gave us this model 2,000 years ago, right? Letter D, how are you to serve in God's kingdom? Big question mark. How are you supposed to serve in God's kingdom? Here's a great one, ready? Number one, serve with all that is within you. Serve with all that is within you. Serve with all that's within you. Deuteronomy 10, 12. Romans, he should come up on the screen. Romans 12, 1. Colossians 3, 23. Serve the Lord with all that's within you. What does that look like? It might look like sweating. I'm, I'm painting in the offices right now. And, and my, I, there's nothing pretty about my painting. It'll look pretty when it's done. But man, I'm like, shh, 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 shh. I'm sweating. They got the air conditioning on 63 degrees. And I'm sweating. My t-shirt's sweating. Because I'm getting it done. I'm getting in it. I get that job done. I'm doing, I'm going at it with all that's within me. That's how we are to serve the Lord. If you're going to do something, why not give it your all? I asked my staff that. If you're going to do this job, why not do it right? Why not do it right the first time? Why not give it your all the first time? Well, you know, I got to do it once or twice. So you have to be wrong once or twice to learn how to do it right. I mean, I think that's part of the problem in America today. How about you take a moment and think? Create a strategic plan. And then we do it once the right way with all that's within us. We don't want to create patterns of failure, then get it right. Let's think, plan, and maybe you can't think it out yourself, so let's have a team meeting. Let's have a quick um, creative meeting. Plan this thing out, sketch it out, and get it done right the first time. Go all the way, or don't go at all. 
Like, if you're going to serve, go all the way. Let's go all in on this. Or let's not do it at all. <coughs> all right, number two. <coughs> How are you to serve in the kingdom of God? Serve to meet the needs of others. Serve to meet the needs of others. Romans twelve ten. At times, you must put aside your own needs in order to help others. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in Mark 6, Jesus was facing... Two needs. He had two needs going on. First, John the Baptist had recently been put to death by Herod, and Jesus was having to deal with the loss of his cousin, friend and minister of God. So that's one. Second, Jesus and his disciples were fatigued from their constant ministry to people. And in spite of Jesus' needs, in spite of him being heartbroken over his cousin, in spite of him being tired, of, of everything he was doing, the Bible says that he was moved with compassion and served the needs of people around him. Sometimes, most of the times, we need to put others first. Um, early on in my marriage, we, we read a book, and this guy, one of the chapters was uh, titled, I'm Third. I'm Third. And that's a real hard number to place yourself in when most of us like to be number one. God first, your spouse second, yourself third. I'm third. It's very hard to put anybody before our own needs and wants. I think moms can sometimes do that with their kids, especially when they're babies and they're young. I think females are a little bit easier. Guys, a lot, we just selfish, all right? We just, <laughs> we don't even understand. Like, why, why you got to get up every time the baby cries? I don't understand it. Just let a baby cry. <laughs> I'm third. Can we serve the needs of others even when we feel that we're in need? Number three, serve even though you may be rejected by others. Woo! Serve even when you're rejected by others. Man, I tried to help you once and you didn't let me help you. I ain't never helping you again. So easy, right? That happened to me the other day. I was walking into the mall. I don't go to the mall very often, but I went to the mall. And I try to be a gentleman. I, I try. Trust me, you can ask anybody. I'm the guy who's always looking to help somebody. If somebody's at Home Depot and they can't load their truck, I'm always jumping and helping them load their truck. Always, always, always. And so my parents, my dad raised me to be a gentleman. So I'm, I'm walking into the mall and I open the door and there's this group of ladies coming behind me. So I stand there and I hold it for them. And this lady says to me, I can hold the door myself. I had to pray in the spirit a little bit. Just kind of walk away. Like that got me hot. That got me upset, man. Made me, I don't ever want to hold the door for another woman again. Open your own dang door. I ain't open your door. We, we in the new century, we in a new day. Open your own door. You don't need no man to do that for you. We all wear jeans now. Right? That's what happens in my mind. I got upset. It's so easy when someone burns you or says something to you when you're trying to serve them. You know, ladies, you make that dinner. You've been working on it all day, and you set that dinner plate down to your husband. He's like, it's cold. My wife's Hispanic. I've learned to just eat it even if it's nasty. My wife makes this, this one dinner called uh, ensalada bacalao. It's like salad. It's like <laughs> salad with chunks of cod, like dried salted codfish in it, like fake in a box. 
You don't buy fish in a box. So if I, if I call home and my, I'm sorry, Carmen, but I call, I call home and if my wife, she says, oh yeah, di- dinner tonight in Salada Bacalao, I'm going to Taco Bell. Because be like, no, nah, I'm good. I ate already. <laughs> it's better to just say, no, nah, I'm good. Didn't have to say something nasty about the meal, right? Because when, when, when someone says something nasty about your meal, like you put time and energy into that, right? You get upset, so you get rejected serving somebody. And it's so easy to say, you know what, then do it yourself, and I'm done. I'm done serving you. Nothing's ever good enough for you, right? So serve, even if you've been laughed at. Jesus was laughed at. He was accused by religious leaders of being satanic, right? He was accused by his own family and friends of being out of his mind. He was forsaken by many who had previously followed him. He was forsaken by everyone, even those closest to him as he hung on the cross. He was denied by the person he considered to be his closest friend, Peter. And at the end of his earthly life, as he was serving us in the greatest way possible by giving his life for us, he was spit on, hit, and slapped. He was scourged, tortured, and ridiculed. He hung on a cross naked and raised high in front of all to see. In his final act of service for all of us. Serve. What does it mean to serve? Serving means that even if you don't ever get rewarded on earth for it, know that God will reward you. God will reward you. Matthew 6 says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of other people. Woo! If you do, you will have no reward from your heavenly Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your heavenly Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Listen, when you seek attention from people for what you do, the reward is that people got to see you. Big deal. That was it? You did all that just to be seen? That's it, done. The Bible says that those who serve the Lord... Those who, those who work unto the Lord, it says that they store treasures in heaven. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know what the actual ratio is. I don't know, hey, every time I say Jesus, I get a silver coin in heaven. Like, I don't know. I don't know what the ratio looks like. I don't know what the payout is. But he didn't say those who serve the Lord get a couple bucks in heaven. It says treasures And the Bible says that heaven is paved with streets of gold. Now around here, pavement is cheap. That's why they put it on our highways. Notice we don't got no concrete roads around here, too much money, right? Pavement is cheap. And the Bible saying that God paves streets with gold, gold to him is cheap. But that's little. Gold, that's nice, that's cute. Gold is cute. I pave with that. I pave with that. But I'm storing treasures for you. Jesus says, I, I, must, I must needs go. He says, I must needs go away and prepare a place for you. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't tell you it. Now think about that. How big is his house? that he got mansions in his house. 
He said, in my father's house are many, many mansions. I wonder what my crib looks like. <laughs> right? We're storing these things up. We, listen, Jesus said this, when you do it unto the least of these, you've done unto me. When you served the least of these, you served me. Only God's reward, only God's reward brings true fulfillment. A word of affirmation, someone telling you how great you are, that lasts for one moment and your bucket is emptied again. Listen to what I'm saying. It's emptied. All of us, our emotional buckets are emptied all the time, looking for something new to fill it. But God's rewards, what God does, they're eternal rewards. You never run empty on those. You never run dry. That's what Jesus was saying. We were talking about this on Sunday. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, you drink the water that I have, you'll never thirst again. Because <coughs> my rewards don't run out. <coughs> they're ongoing. They're life-giving. Constant over and over and over again. Amen? That is the topic of serving. God has called us all to serve the local church in some magnitude. Well, Pastor Mike, I look around the church and what I do, I don't see here. Then let's start it. Let's create it. Let's find new ways to do what you do. Right? You can't sit back and say that, that, that the church doesn't do what you do. I have a dream. I have a vision. Here, here's just one of my dreams, one of my visions. I love working on cars. I would love as a church that all single moms, low income single moms could bring their vehicles to church when they need brakes, when they need an oil change and they bring the stuff with them. They bring their pads and, and their rotors and they bring what they need. They get it from AutoZone or whatever. And a couple of guys here at Family Church who love to do that sort of thing. During church, during church, take, take the car into the shop. They work on it. They got their Christian music playing out there. And after service, that, that mom, that single mom, is able to drive her car out of here with brand new brakes, rotors, pads, oil change, whatever. It's like it's a dream of mine that we're not just doing this, but we're doing church. We're serving one another with what we need. Now, I've never seen that before. I don't know anybody who does that. But I know there's a bunch of gearheads in this area who don't really fit into church, but they could sit out in the shop and work on cars and serve God. Come on, somebody. We're just, we're just, we're thinking that this is what church is. You are the church. So whatever revs you up, whatever gets you excited, whatever gets you out of bed, that's how you're called to serve others. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you tonight. That maybe one thing we said tonight sparked something new in someone who's never stepped out to serve before because maybe they didn't fit status quo church. God, help us to break the mold of what others have said church is. Help us to serve the kingdom of God to the capacity that we are called to serve. God, I pray that you inspire us, you speak to our hearts, you move in this place and in our lives, that God, we can create space and new avenues and new ways to serve the kingdom today. We thank you for that. As we leave here today, Lord, I thank you that we're protected and safe. Watch over this word. Allow it to perform in our lives. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. Have a great night.